Let's see what Paja wants for the buffs. Gwen bounce ideas. I decided to put my ideas with seven blocks, one for each faction plus neutrals. I'm going to post my final votes here as I still don't have, didn't fully decide on them yet, but this is the list of cards I would pick from. <clears throat> MO is in a good spot right now, but I include a few buffs to some cards that could make the greedy Deathwish archetype more competitive. Why? In addition, I would also nerf Incubus as the card plays for too many points right now, and I'll go to mid range gurney decks. Well, why don't you nerf those decks? <laughs> Like, if, if it only plays for that many points in those two decks, then nerf those two decks' ability to, to, to use Incubus. Don't nerf Incubus for decks that are already weak. This is why you don't target decks. You target cards, and you make the cards be balanced. And if Incubus resing a 4 provision is playing for 16 points, well, maybe it's the 4 provision card's fault. So nerf that card. Weavis Incantation. Power increase to 6. Yeah, that's good. Marilyn, power increase to five. Sure, maybe. Haunt decrease, yes. Penitent decrease, yes. But again, like, <clears throat> Deathwish is just already a deck. Uh, let's see his Scoia'tael changes. Eudora, yeah, I'm fine with this change. I, It was on my list, too. Watcher power increase, sure. Sursa power increase, I don't know that that would do a lot. It would still be a seven for seven. But with the harmony tag, yeah, this would need more. Like this would need to be like six P or something. The Hakam Forge one provision to the leader. It's already got sixteen, man. Like, <laughs> it's it's the fact that like when you play this leader, you're incentivized to play only dwarves, and o and only dwarves does not answer stuff that you need to answer. That's the problem. If you want to buff this, like, um, yeah, I can't think of a way to, to fix dwarves without, with just power provision increases. Why did Hayden kill so much? Because in, like he said, in the, um, in the, Ogroid and mid-range Gurney decks, Incubus plays for a lot. So let's say you res like a four power, four provision card for your opponent, and you're resing a 10 for yourself because you can in Ogroids, then your Incubus played for eight points. But if you res like a one power unit, which sometimes you can because they're NR and they played the we just had the the thingy. Or like their Nilf card and they played Blightmaker or they played a Slave Driver. Okay, Slave Driver is probably a reasonable example. You Incubus plays for 16 on your side, 3 on his side. So it's it plays for 13 points. It's 12, 12 or 13 points. Um no, it, it doesn't it doesn't play for 16. Oh, you're talking about the, the provision for dwarfs. Yeah. Yeah. 16 is already like the highest. Um so yeah, and like Ogroids, it plays for 12 points. And it's a point slammy 12 points, right? Whereas like a Corsair plays for 12 points that require damage. Take your VIP and give it to Matol. <laughs> I have strict rules on VIP. In order to get VIP, you either have to help me win games or help me buy food. <laughs> Matol can have a sword. There you go. That way nobody can ban him or time him out. Haha! -ha! And now he's my employee. Alright, Matol, get cooking. Update the title, please. Yeah, you can ban Kareem. You actually can, but you shouldn't. I generally frown upon uh uh people banning diamonds, but you know. If the situation warrants it. <clears throat> this is why Spiro also has a sword. Yeah, and then in the mid-range Gurney deck, it's resing a Griffin. So it's like 15 on your side and then 3 or 4 on the opponent's side. So it's playing for 11 or 12. And it's like, it's kind of a all in one turn. Like getting 11 points of tempo means that you can bleed with it. And being able to bleed and not lose a card is a huge tool in competitive games. When you know all the cards your opponent has in an open deck list... Like, you know that if you play this, 
he will have to play two cards. Like, that's it. Right? And so, in those hands, it's very powerful. It's not nearly as good on ladder. Like, one... I, I, because on ladder, there's a lot of decks that don't have a good 4P for you to res. Or just don't even play bronzes. Uh, there's a lot of times where, like, your your ogre doesn't get to 10 power at all. Um, just because, like, you didn't draw enough ogres or whatever. It, it, it's... You, you can. Yeah, you can definitely have VIPs. Hey, Kaolin. Etc. Anyway, that, that's the answer you... But, like, let's say in a vamp deck, you're resing a flutter. Assuming you got Operator in the previous round and you operate a flutter on their side, which is a pretty big assumption considering most people play Ren Free. And in Ren Free, that's very hard to do because you can't, like, how do you put Operator in your hand, right? Or, sorry, how do you put a flutter in your hand and then, like, you can't decree for an Operator either. It's, it's very, like, I'd say, like, one out of three games, maybe you could pull that combo off. But let's say you've done it. And then in the next round, you can open with Incubus into Flutter on both sides and leader it. So for an Incubus plus a leader, you get nine points of tempo and he's got Cardus bleeding by two. So let's just say 11 points. So for one Incubus plus leader in a vamp deck, it plays as an 11. But if you take the leader out and the leader's five of those points, it's really playing as a six. <clears throat> And giving you an engine. Six plus an engine. Like, that if you're not against Nilfgaard or Skellige or Bounty, they can't use that same engine that you're giving them. So, like, that's a lot of ifs. And I don't, like, I don't think Incubus and Vamps is at all, like, it's it's good. It's, I, I run it, but it's not an OP card. Incubus and Deathwish is not a thing. Uh, Incubus and Thrive, like... Again, only if you're resing a fiend, it's you get 14 minus 4. So it's like 10 points of points now, right? The real problem is Fiend, Griffin, and the 4P Ogroid are dumb point slam cards that can be summoned and play for their full points. And so that's where it's seeing value. It's not in other decks. So that's why personally I don't think it should be it needs a power nerf. Although I don't care if he gets a power nerf, honestly. Like, because the situations where a lot of these other decks play it. Um, it's not that one point isn't as critical as getting the card out. It is a nerf to Thrive because right now, like, you can play Incubus and Thrive because Incubus is six power. Like, Thrive decks run Kashi or Kiki, and every point above four is huge, okay? So, like, yes, for Fuka, it doesn't matter because it will still go to six because it has Thrive too. But in general, like... Once you get to six power, it's a lot harder to proc Thrive. Renfri's Gang is six, Dorgary is six, Fisher King is six. Like, there's not, like, there's Goliad at 12, but, like, there's nothing in between those, usually, you know? So, it, it is a nerf to Thrive decks. Do you have power buff to Flutter so you don't have to lead air unit every single game? To yeah, it's kind of silly that this, this card, the Flutter, is unplayable. Ice Giant. Yeah, Ice Giant. Ice Giant. 7 for 5. Griffin, by the way, is also 7 for 5 with Carryover. Which is, like, not that different from Sesame. Sesame, everybody says is OP. But that card is uh, 5 coins and 4 points of Carryover. Or 4 coins of Carryover, right? So that's 9 for 5. Or if you convert a 1.5, which is what most people do, that's a 13 for 5. Um... But it's got conditions and it's a carryover card. I feel like Incubus is fine as a as it is. The real problem is the 4P Ogroids and um, Alpha Werewolf. But anyway, we've talked about that enough. So we were looking at Scoyatel. Yeah, Mahakam Forge getting giving you 17 provisions is like insane. You know what's gonna happen is. People will just run Forge but not play Dwarves. This is a bad change. I don't think... I think this is one of those things where everybody agrees this deck is... This leader is like Terabad. And so let's just buff it. But that's... They haven't thought it through. I don't think they've thought it through. Like... Like I'm just gonna run like the Precision Strike deck but with Malcolm Forge. 
and I'll run a couple of dwarves, like the defender. Uh, there's some dwarves that are just way better with armor. Uh, the skirmisher, you know, the berserkers become eight for fours. Like these cards that you already play in a mid-range precision strike deck, right? So just instead of playing Gorilla Tactics and Shiru, you just play Mahakam Forge because you get two extra provision. Three ex Wait, how much is Gorilla Tactics now? Gorilla Tactics got nerfed, right? A while back. I think it's 14 provisions. No, it's 15. It's 15. So, so you'd get two more provisions, right? So you just play this deck and you take out the Shiru and you put in some dwarves like this. Right? Because if this has armor, it comes down as a six point removal. Like you have to spend a parasite or a spear or whatever to kill to stop this engine. Or I guess you can take its armor away, but then the leader can, you know, and then you you still run Mahakam Pass, because that's like gives you a free tempering. Um You can you can run chariots, berserkers, skirmishers, offering, rock like all of these cards are like none of these cards are dwarf cards. You can literally just change this to Mahakam Forge. If you don't need this, if you're not running the Shiru and the Milva, you can run like Zoltan. And you can upgrade something by, like, you have five provisions to spare. That's a lot of provisions. This is not a good change. I hope he reconsiders. Oh, yeah, you just play Renfrey. That's another option. Because, like, you just use Forge on. A defender or a berserker or Zoltan or whatever you want. Oh uh, yeah, you you also put like you would play Eudora, right? Because Eudora's eight P now, and Paja wants to give it one more power. And again, I, like I don't have a problem with this, but when was the last time the dwarf deck needed more tempo? The reason it doesn't get played is because it doesn't have good control and answers. The dwarf archetype, rather. And like to off like if you if you even need even more thinning, you could always just run the, the dwarves now. The the five feet dwarves. Because you have three provisions. Like I don't even know what to do with one provision right now. I could have two. Where are these thinner guys? Thinny boys, there you go. Yeah. Because this this is what like you could just play this. And it'd be stupid good. Because Simless into Armor's Workshop with Cranmer is like a million points. Especially if you have Mahawk and Pass also. So if they give you a long round, they lose. And then you can also very good at bleeding because... Um, well, you don't need to bleed. <laughs> anyway. Like, that's what would happen. Dwarves would become just a mid-range bucket. Simless Provision Increase... Yeah. Simless is too good. Too versatile. I'm sad because what CDPR should have done was just limit him to two specials. But people are still playing him in decks with two specials. Because because backup plans are 5P. And Armor's Workshop is kind of busted. When you can play both of them together. Like, if you were playing these from hand, opponent could squirrel one. And then the second one doesn't play for like 15 points. Like, talk about, talk about a busted card, by the way. You think Incubus is busted. Like, this is just 9 points of boost and 6 points of armor. So just against Svalblood, this is 15 points, right? Or if you have Cranmer. Like, and it's fine. It's fine for combos to exist. I'm just saying, like... They, they buff this to buff dwarves, and then what happens? People play it in Shiro Gorilla Tactics. Like, stop buffing cards as a way to buff archetypes. Just stop it. Just stop. Please stop. Please stop trying to buff archetypes by buffing individual, like, one-off cards. Please, please, please stop. Please, I beg you. Don't do the CDPR. Just buff, like, four weak cards that all want to play in that archetype. And buff them a little bit at a time. If you concentrate the buffs on a leader or on, on a card, uh, then that card will just be played in other decks. Like, I can put Eudora in any deck that has one Zoltan. And I always want to play my Zoltan. So, 
there's no I'm not at risk of not drawing this. Plus, it thins my deck even if I never played a Zoltan. Like this is a very this is one of the best thinners. Aside from musicians, this is probably the best thinner in the game. Because it banishes itself. I cannot stop. I'm addicted because CDPR made me one. <laughs> Thank you. A glaze to 9p now. Like, this is one of those academic exercises that people do because they like they've never seen a glaze in the wild. Uh, because the glaze doesn't exist at their MMR. Like Lirio mentioned something similar. And it's like you haven't fully considered the ramifications of this. And the problem is when you when you do something like this, trying to get people to reverse it next next cycle will be impossible. Philavandril 11p? Okay, that's fine. It's 12 is very expensive. Zoltan minus one provision. Yeah, it's just not worth it at nine. It's, I don't like buffing resilience, but like it's not the direction I would go to buff to buff dwarves. But and now I focus on buffing devotion and R and nerfing the two most present cards in every NR deck. But devotion is just as cancer. Buffs to marine and Bellahoon would directly help devotion decks, but it would be cancer gameplay. He's he's doing the CDPR thing. He's buffing decks instead of addressing cards. McMarine already plays, uh, you know, if, if you're using it on a dueler, that that boost is worth a lot. And Bellahoon, like, protects every degenerate NR card that you have to answer. It's just going to be like, NR will be good unless it's facing SK or NG. Like you you want to buff NR? Nerf nerf SK and Nilfgaard. Like that's how you make NR more playable. In, in my opinion. Amphibious assault provision decrease now. Philippa sure yes. Visigard. I'm not sure how, how playable this will be with a provision decrease, but. And I hate Philippa as a card. It's such a bullshit card, right? Because like there's no counterplay. But it's. 11, 11 provisions, I think it's fine for a card to be powerful. Um, notice nobody's talking about Yaga, which is also 12p. <laughs> That's why I try to focus on buffing the Firestone Arc that. Oh my god, stop it! When did Pajabal get Shinmiri disease? Stop it! You don't think CDPR tried this already when they buffed all the Firestone bronzes and we just made OTB decks with them? Oh my god. This is the problem, man. Reddit's not the problem. The problem is like the intellectuals of our scene are not systemic thinkers. How please? Dude, I can I've done what I can. I I made I made a video, I made a deck, I posted on Reddit. Go upload my, my Reddit post, I guess. The rest is up to you guys. I I, I don't know. I can't. Ward per menace test? What? Tack or track? T oh, you want me to take a ward per minute test? No, just practice typing till you go till you get better. Just Google like typing test. Are you applying to be a secretary? Like why do you need a ward per minute test? I'm not I'm not committing fraud for you on stream, I'm sorry. Or at all. Ulrich is fine. Eternal Fire Priest? No, this card is already strong. Procession? This is the shame as Shinmiri's suggestion. My god. Firestorm has never lost a game because their Procession didn't play for 13. And instead play for 12. Not to mention this is the only tall card in the deck. King of Beggars Provision Increase? Eh... Uh... How V decrease? Fine. Like, I don't care. But Congregate already has 16 provisions. Do they not know this? Like, if provisions were going to fix it... Because, like, the thing is, you play Helvid in every Firestorm deck. You just always do. No, it's not the only tall card. What other tall card do you play in a Congregate deck? Fallen Knight? Okay. But, like, if they had removal for Fallen Knight, they'd remove it when it's a 6 or 7 power, don't they? 
Cold Necker spam decks? What possible? You mean swarm decks? No, I, I get it. I get that it helps with, like, makes it. But when the best card in the archetype is Gregory followed by Hamelfart, you're not going to play Firesworn Golden Necker. And I say this as someone who's probably played more Firestorm Golden Necker games than anybody except Trusky. <laughs> that's because it was a Miamon deck that's made to counter a specific meta, I'll say. And he doesn't run Toad. My decks do. Like, so does the, the Spelling Bee deck. You can't point to a Miamon deck and say, see? That's not what is in the meta. Like, Miamon is... He doesn't run Heat Wave in, in Svalblood. Okay? Does that mean that there's not Heat Wave in the meta? Come on, man. You, 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 use your... Use your brain cells. The, this is a bad idea. And then King of Beggars... A provision increase to King of Beggars, all it does is it removes one provision from every Syndicate deck. It doesn't do anything. This just makes Jackpot less viable, which I promise is not what uh, Faja is intending here. But this is this is what I mean. This is the wrong way to balance. He's thinking of decks that, that don't see play at the competitive level, and he's like, how can we buff cards that will buff those decks? <laughs> like, I don't have a problem with Ulrich being 10p, right? And Helvid being 9p. But both of these cards are only played in Firesworn. And all this does is give that deck two more provisions. Are we really saying congregate? Like, it's not like people weren't running them before and will now be playing them. Remember my impact criteria? Will this change make a card from not being played to being played? If it doesn't affect a card's playability, don't do the change. It is a dumb change. If the card already gets played, and will still get played after you nerf or buff its power or provision, then your change is a bad change. That's the kind of change you should only do when all the cards are balanced. Okay, all the cards are playing for reasonable levels, but Imperial Formation has a slightly more win rate than Enslave. Let's buff that by 1p, right? That's when you make those kind of archetypal changes. And changing a must-have card for an archetype is literally the same as uh, the same as buffing their leader by one provisions. This is bad. This is the wrong way to do it. Yes, he's an amazing player. Yes, he's smarter than me when it comes to Gwent, but he's wrong about this. So is Shinmiri. They are both 100% wrong about this. The same way that like if I go to Einstein and tell him that 2 plus 2 equals 4, he says no, it's 2 plus 2 equals an apple. He's wrong and I'm right. It doesn't matter if he has 200 IQ. He, he comes down to 6 plus 4 coins. So he's like a 10 for 10 right now. I don't personally have a problem with this change. But to say that I want to buff Firesworn and then make these changes is wrong-headed. Because, like... <laughs> we'll just... This is 4 provisions. This is free. Making it 5 power. So that if I drop it and then click Disciple, it's instantly at 6. Uh, and now I get... My Disciple turns from a... You know, two points per turn to a three point per turn. And my Hamelfort has yet another target. Being a good player doesn't mean you're a good coach, or also doesn't mean like you're a good soccer ball designer. Okay? <laughs> like, doesn't mean you're a specialist on, on grass just because you run really fast on a on a pitch. <laughs> doesn't mean that you can't be either, okay? <laughs> yeah, no, I know, I know. I'm just I'm just uh, improving your analogy there. <laughs> like, you may be really good at the game. And so, if we want advice on how to play the game, or how to make the fun the game, or you can tell us what's not fun for you as a player, but you may not always know what would be more fun for you. Like, players often, uh, and this is like at all skill levels, will say like, I want this change. And what you should do as a designer is say, tell me why. Like, what problem does that solve for you? Once you understand the problem, then as a designer, you should look at the whole system and then say, what is the best way to address this problem? Sometimes it's the way they suggest it, sometimes it's not. 
But whenever somebody comes to you with a solution and asks you to implement it, you should always, always find out why and then see if the solution they're suggesting is the best solution that you'd independently arrive at. And if the two are the same, then sure, implement it. But if they're not, you know, you, you may need to do some more digging. For NG, I mostly included cards from various archetypes that could use a buff. Uh, another archetype approach. Golem and Hyper Thin? But Golem's already good in Constructs. See what I mean? Like, he's trying to buff Hyper Thin, but it's just going to buff Constructs. Um... Because NG is like one of the two factions that has their, uh, or NG is the only faction that has their own construct, right? Technically Frightener, but you don't play that card. You play the the artifact. Are there any other constructs in the game? Golem is shit. Yeah, but it buffs every other construct. You played for zero on average? How do you play it for zero on average? Is the enemy deck full of processions of penance every time you drop it? You hit dragon and ogres? Mulligan it against those two decks. What's the use of this card? Um, for like reveal hyper thin. Also, Mill uses it because the, the enemy deck is empty. And so he doesn't realize that's buffing Mill. Paja hasn't seen Mill in like years. That's not true, but like once he's played like 10 games, he's never in he's never seeing a, a Mill MMR ever again. Fine. Like, it's not like I think at 13 it's going to be overpowered or anything. He's not changing his provisions. So, it, it, it's not... I don't object to the change. The opponent always draws a shuffled card. I mean... Kareem, now you're just, like, in Spiro territory. <laughs> you're like, math doesn't apply to my games. <laughs> like, it shuffles it. <laughs> like it does and if it doesn't submit a bug report like like record yourself playing this seven times and all seven times your opponent drawing it and be like well mathematically the odds of the card getting shuffled into the top three of, of the opponent's deck given the number of cards they had and having it happen seven times in a row is 0.01% that's how they like prove election fraud right they say that the probability of these seven things happening all in a row is so low that the alternative explanation must be the correct one yeah, sure. This it's used in mill, but I don't think like buffing it by one power is gonna make make or break mill. Provision decrease on Joachim. I mean, Lauren believes Joachim is very good in ball, and I I was able to use it, and I thought it was very helpful. Because with Artfane, you know what you're getting. And there is power. There is value. Like, they're just looking at other points per provision. They're like, this is an 8 for 10. Plus one thinning. That's not very good anymore. But it's... Like, it's forcing a tall removal when it's when you use it on engine. Because, because pro players have their games be decided by one point. And, and they don't play cards like Yoakim that on paper are 8 for 4s. Or eight, 8 for 10s. Oh. Oh, power D. Yeah, this is the buff. He wants to prevent clogging? No, he says... I mostly include cards from various archetypes that could use a buff. Like Golem and Hyper Thin, Serid and G, or Joachim and Spice. He's trying to buff it. He's not trying to prevent clogging. He says he wants to buff it. And you don't run Joku if you're trying to board clog, you just play emissaries. 
Seret is the weakest one. Seret is the, the, the weakest one. But he doesn't... Oh, Seret's right there. Power increase? I don't know if power increase is it. Because it would still be... Like, it would still be a bad card, right? It would be... It does two damage. So it would be an eight for seven. Instead of a seven for seven. Joachim Clog is a sim 10 years ago. Yeah. Well, would rather have it at four? I mean, it's... The, the value in Ball is that it gives you a target that you can apply a status to. And you want it to live so that your imposter leader is one more point. But if you're reducing the points on the enemy side by one, that offsets the, the leader anyway. But for like um, Seditious Aristocrats, it's one more point also. Um, if if you're playing Seditious late, right? Because if Seditious is on the board when you play this, then you get the points. Yeah, Ball has Roderick and Joachim. And if they don't have an Arbalest tier on the board, then then they also have a Deathwind Arbalest or whatever, They ha then they also have Spice. Ball also has a lot of removal, Kareem. But yeah, they, they can they can do some clogging. Like I I've had I've lost the games, I've lost games versus clog because they clogged my melee row, to prevent uh, Vilgefortz. But again, like Paja literally says right here, in English that he's doing this as a buff. Yeah, raw tosser also benefits. Kareem's been playing some some ballless ball. Puzzle, if you didn't know. Yeah, it's absolutely a buff. And he's trying to buff it. Like, but it also has, there are some value in keeping it at four. Like, it, it, it's, it's not like a straight buff. It's like buffing like 60% of situations and then... 30% of the situations, it's a nerf, and then in other situations, it's a wash. Two Joachims, Roderick, two Usurper guys. And Rosa, yeah, that's true. But are, are you really getting a lot of long rounds as Masquerade Ball? Should both believe to seven so he can't, he can't be enslaved easily? He already is seven in an imposter deck. You don't play Philippe until there's four statuses on the enemy side of the board. <laughs> ball doesn't need a buff! I literally, like, played Ball to 2500 trivially last season. Ball doesn't need a buff. <laughs> Why are we trying to buff Ball? Just because nobody knows how to play it well doesn't mean it needs a buff. The deck is very strong. Like, I, I I don't know I don't know how else to say how to say this without being coming off rude or disrespectful. But pro players have these blinders on. I feel like so many of them, they're just they think that the Gwent is like twelve decks. They they literally think that it's like twelve decks. The twelve decks that are meta, and and they're thinking in terms of those decks and how to counter those decks and what would nerf those decks and what would buff those decks. And it's like. That's the game has 1600 cards. Versus is trying to buff alumni. Yeah, I heard. It's so stupid. They might succeed too. There's a lot of them. <laughs> Famous quotes about Russians. There's a lot of them. <laughs> yeah, but puzzles a deck builder. Most competitive players are not deck builders. It's like Lirio, Trusky, Puzzle, Kerpetin is a tweaker, El Calor is a tweaker, Miamon, sure, he's a deck builder. As weird as Miamon's buff changes were, they're t I like them better than Paja's. 
Yeah, pa I didn't say Pasha's not a deck builder. I, 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 don't, I don't know enough to say if he's a deck builder or not. But usually I see him playing decks that somebody else made and he just like makes them better or something. Me and my nerf squirrel. That's awesome. And beautiful mission losing a provision is is fair. Sandor going to nine P. No. This is this is this is like another Lirio thing. He got these from Lirio. This is why I I was so disappointed with Lirio's approach to trying to make Golden Ecker viable. Like, as someone who tries to make lots of piles and tries to make them work because I don't care about my MMR and because I play like hundreds of games every season more than most of the pros because they spend their time playing good decks and learning lines and practicing matchups and I spend like once once a deck has been figured out I move on and I make a new deck the my criticism of Lirio's uh post was that instead of trying to make Golden Ecker viable by changing taking 10 provision cards and making them 9p you should instead buff six, seven, and eight peak golds. Like again, if you're if you're thinking systemically, you understand that golden necker decks have a lot of provisions, right? Which is why Shinmiri's suggestion to make golden necker ten provision is idiotic, asinine, and stupid. Shinmiri is none of those things, but that suggestion is moronic. So is making puzzle nine provision. Also, one of the stupidest changes I've heard come from a smart person this season. He's a monstrosity builder. <laughs> That's a compliment. <laughs> um, anyway, when you're making Golden Necker decks, you have like... Either you're playing something that has really good 4Ps and wants to play lots of... lots of 4s and 5s, in which case you have to stack a bunch of 9s, or you're playing something that's playing 4, 5, 6... 6... Like, Golden Necker decks have a lot more 5, 6, 7, and 8 provision cards than non-Golden Necker decks. And so, like, broadly speaking, if you want to make Golden Necker more competitive, more viable, there's two things you do. You make buffs to those mid-tier cards that you, you generally don't want to run in a normal deck because you prefer the high-end golds and, and the lowest provision bronzes, right? Or, or and, you Im Im improve the consistency of Golden Necker. Like... Instead of, like, doing some one-off provision nerfs to Sandor or Compass or whatever that only affect one deck or one archetype, you make you make a change like make Avalok, which is an artifact tutor, B9 provisions. Like, if you ask me how to make Golden Necker more competitive, change this to 9 provisions. Because then I can tutor, I have two artifacts in deck. I can tutor one of them with this, and now I know what my Golden Necker is going to get. I know it's going to get Candle, or I know it's going to get the other location, right? Like, this is this is how you buff Golden Necker. And it's neutral, and it's across the board, and improves consistency. And it doesn't overwhelmingly favor, like, Sand or Clog decks, or uh, Compass decks, or whatever, right? This is how you make Golden... Because what you want to do when you're a curator of a garden, which is what Gwent is, it's a bunch of cards... Like, you should not be picking winners and losers. You're a market regulator, okay? <laughs> like, take some economics. You don't sit there and say, buff this corporation. Instead, you facilitate the environment for new, like, decks to rise organically. And how do you do that? You remove barriers to entry. And what's a barrier to entry for a lot of Golden Necker archetypes? It's that they can't consistency grab Golden Necker or that they don't function as YOLO Golden Necker decks. Like, Golden Necker decks need to be like, any card from this deck coming off of Golden Necker should work with any card, because if I have the Golden Necker round one, and and I draw the wrong things, that's it, my game is over. Or if I don't draw Golden Necker, my game is over, which is why Syndicate was one of them, and why Nilfgaard was one of them, and why Skellige was one of them, because they all had really good consistency and, and good tempo round one. Those are like the competitive Golden Necker decks, right? That we've seen. Sind Primarily Syndicate has been the the most dominant Golden Necker deck because Bank could get Golden Necker. You knew you weren't going to miss your Golden Necker because you had Bank. So when they made Bank 10p, that was a huge nerf to just Syndicate Golden Necker. But it was a huge nerf. 
you make this 9p and you make land of a thousand fables 9p and you have single-handedly with those two changes made golden necker good yeah huramalka kareem was making the same point yep yep yes this is lord of the Rings soundtrack Basically, my central thrust from reviewing Pajabal's changes and Shinmiri's changes and Lirio's changes is that all three of them are not systemic thinkers. They are not thinking about... Um, they are trying to buff archetypes by buffing or nerfing under like a, a card that will they think will make that archetype better. And like, But in practice, what they're doing is they're making Congregate be an 18 provision leader they're making uh, Mahakam Forge be a, a, a 17 provision leader. 18 if you count, like, um, this, you know? Like, it it's just going to lead to either us playing using Mahakam Forge leader for a mid-range deck. Like, take the Shiru deck, take out take out Shiru and put in uh, Zoltan. And, and now you have, like, three extra provisions for free. Um, and, more, and more consistency because Eudora. Uh, <laughs> and then, or or we're gonna take like um, these congregate cards, some of these congregate cards, like like Helvid and Eternal Fire Priest, and put them in other decks. Like congregate already has sixteen provisions. All this does, since these cards are auto include in every congregate deck anyway, all you're doing is giving that leader two more provisions, which is insane. That's it's insane. You're gonna have an eighteen provision congregate leader. At what point do we just stop and say maybe that archetype is shit? <laughs> Thinking systemically would be not trying to make 10 provision cards like Sandor 9P because I want Golden Necker to be viable. Here's my clown makeup and clown wig. Instead, you say Golden Necker decks need consistency to make sure they can grab their Golden Necker. So why don't we make this 9P so they don't have to like matter to play the gold. Like just make this 9 provisions. What's wrong with that? And make Avalok 9 provisions because that that gives you some consistency on, on your artifacts. And then... Look at the six, seven, eight provision space and find cards to buff, because most normal hyperpolarized decks don't have a lot of these cards, but Golden Necker does. That is like a gentle across-the-board approach that will make new decks viable, which is what you should be doing. You should be eliminating barriers to entry and opening new possibilities, not like trying to like brute force something into viability by making it overpowered, because. Like, all you're doing with the Sandor change is making it so I'm more likely to put it in a regular Assimilate deck. It's not. It's already pretty good in Enslaved 6 with Abduction. Not to mention, you'll make a Golden Necker go, uh, deck good, the Sandor deck, and nothing else, which does nothing. This sort of, like, hyper-targeted Haberdash, like, I don't know, Hebrus-filled, like, dipping your finger in the stew and trying to move the, 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 the meat around to the left side approach is not the way to balance a, a, an ecosystem. It is not. You should, you should be very like... You should be very careful. Chrome Mother to 5 power. I dislike this change. I would rather this be made 9 provisions. Sarah's Fearless power increase? No! Because I have to answer this card or I lose the game. See, he's not thinking about that. He's not thinking about the opponent's point of view. And like, if Sarah sticks, the game is fucking over. Because the game is fucking over. <laughs> he's thinking about like, this card gets answered and it's shit for 10 provisions. How do I make this card be better? I know. If I give it 5 power, then it won't be so shit. Okay. Mission accomplished. It's no longer so shit. But what now? Now we're playing against Sarah's Fearless. <laughs> Olaf buff? Olaf to 9 provisions? Well, that just means Golden Necker Self Loon comes back. Doesn't it? With Sarah... Oh, well, Sarah's would still be 10. Character roll provision increase, I agree with. Power decrease for these two, fine. 
These I agree with. This I would do provision. This I would not. You you can make this provision if you want, but I I don't think Sarah should be harder to kill. Like, what's monster supposed to do to kill a five power unit? Exactly. You know when I love Dodo two the mo Dodo two the most when Valve changed from big patches one to two times a year into small patches every two to three months because you couldn't get out of the meta. When can we hit the first community match? I think it's like four or five days. Got reaches off Henry round one, and I didn't think anything was wrong or broken until I dropped the 50 bone reaches with NG. I've seen a lot of power buffs ideas as binary on binary shit. Yeah, like what puzzle? Like 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 Saris, right? It's this, it's this like obsession with like, yeah, students, Saris, this like, when we talked about students, here's how the conversation went. I said, you know, that would be a really impactful buff for alumni. And like, if you really want to buff them, this is one way to do it. And then I was like, but then like, but then opponents have to have multiple five damage cards in their hand round one or lose the game. And that would suck. So let's not do it. And that's that. Like, that's the arc of the conversation, right? Over the course of 30 minutes, we went from, should we do it? That would be really impactful. It would buff an on the user arch archetype. And then we're like, but wait, how would the opponent feel? How would you counterplay it? Oh, that would be cancer as fuck. That'd be binary as shit. Okay, let's not do it. But somehow, Lirio, Shinmiri, and Pajabal cannot get themselves to do this. Yeah, I like your rune mage, uh, rune word idea puzzle. Like giving them, like alumni getting extra provision or two, is better because maybe then they can fit some consistency, right? Rather than buffing the power of a must answer card, or like making amphibious assault thirteen provisions again is not the answer. God damn it! Stop it. Like, reverting nerfs that were hailed as necessary and good when they were done because, like, the archetype hasn't been seen in a while and you want to make Compass 9 provisions again? I, I don't... I don't have the words. Why does London need a buff? Because we haven't seen it on ladder in a while. <laughs> I don't know. Ask the idiots who are asking for it. Oh yeah, and they like playing it. They think they think it's a skillful deck, right? They think that it's a deck where there's a big gap between a good player and a bad player. And so those metas where like decks like alumni are dominant, Paja can win every mirror like 90% of the time. And that's fun for him. Is it out? <laughs> I'll do it after I finish this. Just know how to beat it? No, it's 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 gotten power crept. I've tried it. It's like some games it's ridiculous and some games it's like they It's mostly like my problem with it was inconsistency. Gentle Pro, the game won't last that, that long. I mean, I always knew that even if like, let's say I think that I am the world's most giga genius game balancer person, okay? Let's just say that I think that. Even if CDPR gave me full control of Go Infinity, I'd be like, I'm not gonna be able to fix this. Because like, they couldn't balance the game when they had full control over card text. <laughs> you think that one power, one provision, buff, nerf, six changes, like, or 60 change, whatever, is going to be somehow fix the game is, like, so laughable. I want to sell these people some timeshares in Florida, right on the beach, okay? <laughs> uh, but to think that the community could do it, oh, my God. Without playtesting, by the way, it's not like there's a PTR like, 
Like, if you were serious about this, you would have, like, a custom map mode or something where... <laughs> where, like, I can make these changes and you and I can play a custom game with those changes. Why can't I do that? Why can't I play a friendly with my Gwinfinity boats? Why was that not the first thing? Like, it tells me that CDPR doesn't test their own shit. Like, any design... Anyone who's ever designed anything or, or, or built anything would know that when you do a thing, you try the thing, right? <laughs> like, let's say you installed an after uh, a, a, a turbocharger on your car. What is the first thing you do? You take it for a fucking ride, right? Install new tires? Go drive, right? <laughs> on your bike, if you have a new flag with a pretty streamer, what is the first thing that you do? Do you... Do you just look at it in your garage or do you go ride around with it or ask someone to like come on that's how you know if it's good or not what do i do when i have to, after as soon as i make a deck i go try it on the ladder so to think that humans these papegas can process abstract things like what would a one power change to a car do to the meta is so idiotic <laughs> Why don't we have a test realm or a test game mode like that? That should be like feature zero before you give people Gwenfinity should be a way for them to try out Gwenfinity. Uh. Not in my day, Window Warrior. There wasn't onboard CPUs in my in the cars that I installed. Turbos off. <laughs> what are we mad about? Just jumped in. I'm upset that some very smart people, like Lirio, Shinmiri, and Pajabol, keep trying to buff archetypes instead of balancing cards. Like he wants to make Weavis one power bigger. Like that's just a buff to cheese decks. <laughs> Or, like, he wants to make Mahaka Forge 17 provisions. We're just gonna play mid range with Forge Leader. Like, you know? Like, Aglaeus Power Buff, really? Or Provision Buff, really? Or, um, like, Bellahoon Buff. So, like, he says, I focused on buffing Devotion in R and nerfing the two most present cards. Like,. <laughs> But why are those cards present? Like, think about it systemically. Like, why? Why is every muta uh, an art deck run Temple and Muta Generator? What? And what are the side effects of that? One of the side effects of running Temple is you can't fit AA. Because why? Because Temple's so important. So what does that mean? You either play Pinsir, which already, like, negates a whole lot of decks that don't want to play Pinsir. They want to play Stockpile or Zeal or uh, Mobilization or whatever, right? So the fact that Temple exists already dramatically distorts your data, right? Um, and if you're not playing Pinsir, you're playing Oniromancy. Oniromancy is 13 provisions. If you're playing a 13 provision Echo Tutor, you're probably not going to play a 14 provision Echo Tutor in the same fucking deck. When that, when Amphibious Assault cannot tutor your Temple or your Mutagen, like you don't need to nerf these and buff AA in the same patch. Like, that's stupid. That's not understanding how things affect each other. That's thinking that every card exists in isolation and every archetype only exists as a deck. Like, there are no decks in Gwent. There are only cards and there are leaders. And when you buff a card, you're going to get, like, that card put into other decks. And those other decks will be OP. And the thing you're trying to accomplish, which is making Congregate meta, will never fucking happen. Stop it. Like... Making Ulrich and Helvede and Procession, which are cards that are already always played in every Congregate deck, one provision cheaper or one power taller or whatever, isn't going to do anything. It's like making Congregate more provisions. But Congregate is already 16 provisions. Oh, what we really needed was for it to go to 17 or 18, and then it would be good, right? No! <laughs> Because it was 15 and we made it 16 and it didn't get any better. And we buffed all the Firestorm cards and it didn't get any better. Do you know why Congregate's not played? Because it's a shit leader ability that has no passive. 
what syndicate leaders get played. Blood Money has a passive now. It didn't before and it never got played. And now that it has a passive, it gets played. Off the Books has a passive. Uh, Line Pockets has a passive. Uh, Renfri overrides your passive, so it's never played in Syndicate. If you don't understand that about Syndicate, you should not be suggesting things. Congregate, no passive. Hidden Cash has a passive. Hidden Cash gets played more than Congregate. It has its own problems, but it gets played more than Congregate. Congregate's just a shit leader design. Giving it more provisions won't fix it. I don't know what any of this means anymore. I'm sorry. No, he suggests lots of monster buffs. This isn't about faction bias. He suggests Weavis buff, Marilone buff, Haunt buff. I agree with these two because like these cards are just objectively garbage for their like provisions. But the way I chose to buff Haunt was by buffing Ruin by one power. Do you see how I'm taking an indirect approach? Because what's going to happen when you make this 13? I can now just stick the same card in my Dagon Brewis Deathwish deck with Succubus. And now I have two extra consumes for one less provision. It will make the deck better, but if it would make the deck better, then it would already be playable now when they made it 16. So somehow like 15, 16 to 17 is like a million times better than 15 to 16. What I'm saying is, I had this car and I painted the left side red and it didn't make it any faster. So now I'm painting the right side red and I'm convinced that somehow if both sides are red, it will go way faster. Like if the first time it didn't, like unless you think that 17, like one extra provision is a magical threshold that's somehow going to change everything. Why does there have to be a line? Why isn't it just a gradient? And sure, if you give it enough provisions, yeah, eventually it will be better. But you know what's going to happen? Like what you what you what you risk doing is is you end up making it so that people play like Madame and, you know, like cards that have nothing to do with Firesworn in this deck cuz it has so many more provisions that is definitely the better one to use. Make it 30 p. Surely it will make will see play then. Yeah, it will. But then we'll just play play like Junior and Jacques and and off the uh, and and King of Beggars and Madame and Novigrad in it anyway, like so it's it's like <laughs> how are you this smart and this stupid at the same time? I don't understand it. So if you agree with me, go upvote my goddamn post or go tell people that their approach is something. I I'm I I I'm exhausted. I am mentally and physically exhausted from talking about this stuff. Like Rainforn? Really? Thank you, Puzzle. I appreciate it. Like, does Rainforn really need a buff? Just because you think a card is shit doesn't mean buffing it is a good idea. You have to think, like... Do you really want more Golden Ecker Tucson? Because that shit is cancer. Like, you don't know. But it's like, can you answer their Siri? Like, can you prevent uh, uh, Sangreal on Siri? Yes or no, right? If no, can you win round one? No, then you lost the game on matchmaking. That's it. E end of story. If you can't answer Siri and you don't win round one, GG, go next. Uh, I've been playing Snap. You want to receive the meta game and it's worse than the game itself? Yeah. Or like this. Like buffing Sarah's Fearless to be even more of an answer or lose card? <laughs> Making Otkel cheaper. Have you guys played Otkel? It's like the best card in the game. You know when Hamelfart came out and Spira was like, Oh my god, this card is giga busted. Now, Congregate is shit, but Hamelfart is giga busted. I'm not playing Hamelfart because the rest of the cards in the deck are shit, but this card is objectively giga busted. 
And guess what? Later, when they buffed the Firestorm Bronzes, Hamelfart was in every deck. Did anybody play Congregate? No! We just put Hamelfart in off the books because it's a good card! <laughs> and now we run the Bronze Firestorm package. Like, that's what they're doing! I saw somebody play Oatskill in Warriors. I saw somebody play Oatskill in Warriors. That's what will happen! You make it, you keep making it just shit cheaper just because it's not getting played. We'll put it in other decks. If something doesn't see play in the archetype for which it was designed, you should understand why that archetype is bad and see if there are changes you can make with Gwentfinity that will make that archetype better. Why is alchemy bad? Alchemy is bad because it's a solitaire archetype that doesn't have control. That's it. Puzzle says, I want the opinion that we do safe vote first. Yes, I agree. And like, to me, making this change to Ceres and Olaf and Otkel, this is not a safe change. This is not a safe change. <laughs> Perfect to increase our Golden Ecker. Pasha, I'm sorry. You have lost one-fifth of the respect I had for you. I'm sorry. You're just dumb now. Hey chat, can any of you Pepegos explain? Explain why? Nerfing Golden Necker by one provision and then buffing Sandor by one provision could be bad. Let's say you wanted to make Golden Necker decks more viable and you thought that making Sandor 9p would make, you know, would be a buff to Golden Necker. What happens when you increase the provisions of Golden Necker? So the Nilfgaard deck would be at the same provision as it was before, now with Sandor as an option. But every other faction's Golden Necker would be one more expensive. Gee. Hmm. You also made Skellige Golden Necker more viable by decreasing Olaf by provision, right? Hmm. Sigvald is already below 9. Canute's already below 9. And if Shinmiri has his way, Compass will be below 9. Uh, will be 9 or below. Huh. So we're going to see another meta where it's just Nilfgaard and Syndicate, Golden Necker. Gee, wow. I sure don't know what that's like. It's not like that's been the meta 65 billion times already. Skellige and Nilfgaard being the two best factions. With some like periods where, where Syndicate is, is, is there too. <laughs> Buff provision for the 8 provision tutors? Yeah, that's fine. Highest and lowest. ADC and uh, marching orders? Those are fine. I like those changes. Yeah, Goldacre has design problems, but I think it's fine because like the, the 9 provision line or whatever, I think that's a fine line because I think Gwent has always needed a platinum card. Because cards that say play a gold are like shit when they apply to, you know, the beast, which is a gold, right? But they're amazing when applied to Fakusia. So like, if you are Todd, you know, <laughs> a Fisher King, that's one thing. But when you are Todd of Fakusia, that's another thing. So there, there should have always been a line in the sand, like 10p and higher is considered legendary, below that is epic. And that, and every card should say, play a legendary or play an epic. Like that, that could have been a clean way to do things. And six provision bronzes should have been silvers. So you can't megascope a messenger of the sea. So you can't illusionist a messenger of the sea. So you can't uh, obsidian mirror three messengers of the sea. Like that would limit the range of some of these cards so that they don't automatically win a bunch of games sometimes because they can apply to six provisions and like be shit the rest of the time. Then you could balance better by having smaller brackets to balance and design around. But that requires systemic thinking right design thinking <laughs> not reactionary this thing's not played let me buff it this thing's played a lot let me nerf it that's not how you design that's not how you balance that's not how you <laughs> uh portal is fine it's like portal as a card it's too expensive for what it does portal at 11 is better portal adds consistency and a lot of decks are not viable because they're inconsistent and so this opens doors literally like 
pun intended. <laughs> Making portal easier to put in your deck opens new possibilities. Portal can go to 10 for all I care. And then, once you do that, you should nerf some cards that are currently for provisions. Like, I think those witchers that start at 7 power and give themselves armor every time are kind of busted with portal. But portal does have some drawbacks and deck building costs. Because you have to have only 4P units in your deck that you want summoned. So you can't put 4P units that have a deploy. If you're playing Portal with Skellige, you can't put Brock War, uh, uh, Warriors in your deck. Portal 11P is still better than Lilith's Omen. Yes, it is. So is every other 11P and every other 10P and every other 9P. Make Lilith's Omen 8 provisions and I'll play it. One player base has been on the decline since it was launched. But that's true for like 90% of games. Obviously, I couldn't fit all the archetypes that deserve a buff in this thread. Vampires, Crime Syndicate, Mages, and R. However, I think it's better to focus on buffing one archetype at a time. Seems to be more meaningful. Uh... I don't know, man. I don't know. <laughs>